Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on Listening for America. Um, my name is Jill O'Donnell. I'm the director of the Clayton Yider Institute of International Trade and Finance here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I am so pleased this morning to welcome Catherine Novelli to this webinar. Catherine has many, many years of experience working in trade policy, including at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Um, she's also worked in the private sector as the Vice President um, for Worldwide Government Affairs at Apple. Um, her most recently in, in public service, she was the Under Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy and the Environment at the State Department. Needless to say, she has a wealth of experience um, in many, many aspects of trade policy. And what we're here to talk about today is a report and a very interesting process that Kathy has just been through. She started a nonprofit just a few years ago called Listening for America. And with a team that she assembled, um, <clears throat> this team had conversations all around the United States, um, every region of the country, to listen to people about what they think about trade policy. Uh, Kathy and her team talked to about 1,000 people um, in 37 cities and just released a report called um, Connecting People with International Trade is the report. I have this wonderful copy here. You can find that um, from the link on our website as well as Listening for America's website. So with that um, introduction, we're gonna go ahead and dive into the report and the findings. And for all of you participating, please use the Q&A function um, in Zoom to submit questions at any point throughout the webinar. I will try to work them into the conversation and also save some time at the end for your questions from the audience. So Kathy, again, welcome um, to this webinar. And I'd like to start by asking you, you know, introduce us to this project. Tell us what compelled you to start the nonprofit Listening for America and why you designed this project the way you did. Um, so tell us a little bit about that and kind of the why uh, behind this project. Okay, well, thanks so much, Jill, and I am absolutely delighted to be here and can't wait to engage on, on all of these things. Um, I started this project because I was uh, dispatched when I was under Secretary of State to talk to people about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that the United States had concluded with a number of countries in South Asia. And um, uh, the goal was to promote this agreement. Um, and I was born and raised in the Midwest, um, grew up uh, a granddaughter of immigrants, all of whom worked in factories and belonged to unions. And so I said, well, I'll, I will um, be happy to go to the Midwest. And what I found when I did that was that uh, there was just a huge disconnect. I found that most people did not support this agreement. They felt that um, this agreement would cause more manufacturing jobs to leave the U.S. They didn't see any benefits. And, um, and the, there was a list of also causing environmental degradation, et cetera. Um, so when I, left, uh, when I left the State Department, I felt like really there was a gap between people inside the Beltway in Washington and everyone else. <laughs> and I really wanted to see what did people whose job wasn't trade policy, um, what did people think about international trade? How did it affect them? What did they think about globalization? Um, were those different thoughts? Um, and then along the way, as we started to talk to people and we used sort of two methods, one was just informal conversations with folks. We tried to make sure we had a random sampling of people from all walks of life, from bank tellers to um, people who were on disability to farmers to um, mayors of cities um, to school teachers, et cetera. And then we also did focus groups, which had representative samples of people in any given, given region. Um, so we sort of combined those things. And um, we found that uh, people generally weren't thinking that much about trade. It wasn't like their main topic. They understood it to be something extremely complicated and they felt like they didn't really understand it and wanted to know more. Um, most people had a very positive uh, view of globalization, which surprised me because the inside the beltway um, 
think is that people don't like globalization. Um, and um, we also found uh, that there were differences depending on where you lived um, and, and then not surprisingly, um, and depending on what you did, also not surprisingly. Um, so, uh, and then we found that there were a number of very common myths that, that people had um, that were understandable um, from the news, but really not what was really happening. So, um, so and, and just the last piece of this, as we started talking to mayors, um, we started to realize that there were some cities that had really taken advantage of the fact that there was a globalized world out there and had been able to plug into that world in a way that really turned around their cities. Um, you know, they had been adversely actually affected by, um, by competition uh, from, from outside the U.S. and were able to kind of turn that to their advantage. And so um, we started also talking to economic planners and people like that in, in cities as well to see who was able to turn the tide and how they did it. Thank you for that introduction to the project. Um, there's a lot to follow up on there that we'll get to. Before we go and dive a little bit more into the findings, I want to ask you though, you'd mentioned that um, you know, during the in the report that whatever preconceived ideas that you'd had before starting this process on this nationwide listening tour, that they were not the reality in the 37 cities that you visited. So what were some of those notions that you had and how did that perhaps shift your approach as you went through the project? Well, I, you know, I tried to be very, we all did, tried to be very neutral you know, and just listen. Um, and I think, you know, we would go to some places where we thought people would not be maybe necessarily that um, enamored of globalization or trade. And then we would, we would find that that was totally not the case, um, which was really interesting in other places where um, like Miami, for example, where the, the city itself, everything going on in that city is connected to Latin America in one way or another. Um, it was almost as if people were oblivious to the fact that all that was going on outside. And they, they had so internalized it that they didn't even see it as international trade. So that sort of surprised us too, um, because I think if you come from the outside, you're like, wow, this place is like all about international trade. But yet when you talk to people, they didn't really perceive it that way. So, um, so there were a lot of those kind of things that, um, that we found. Um, the other thing that we found um, was that most people were okay with competition. Um, there's been this, you know, again, this, this myth inside the Beltway that everybody just wants to be protected. And that isn't really what we found. Um, we found farmers in particular were sort of like, hey, bring it on. We think we can meet it. Um, and, but we found that also we were, it, it was really interesting. Um, in Houston, for example, there were a whole lot of young people that we talked to and they're like, competition, that's good. <laughs> you know, that's an opportunity for us. So um, that was another really surprising thing. Very interesting. Okay, so you mentioned um, a couple of times this um, trade versus globalization, how people think about those two things, how the people that you listen to tended to have a more positive view of globalization and a less positive view of, of trade. So um, what, you know, that's an interesting nuance if you could unpack that a little bit more. And then also just tell us what do you think policymakers should take away from that nuance? Do we conflate trade and globalization too much in terms of how we talk about this in public or how do we you know, have a um, maybe a better discourse about trade um, versus globalization or how we should be talking about this so for better understanding? Just to be precise, people had a bad view of trade agreements, not necessarily trade. And so I think a lot of people felt that trade agreements had caused jobs to leave or were somehow unfair. Um, they couldn't really articulate why or what, but that was their like, like emotional reaction to trade agreements. 
Um, on globalization, I think, you know, and the way we did some of this in focus groups was to have a wall of, of pictures of various things. Some were like hands around the world or interconnectedness or flags of the UN or um, like a fruit stand with all kinds of um, different food on it. Um, some were, you know, smoke stacks spewing out smog. Some were, you know, factory closed. So kind of a wide range of various things. And for globalization, when we ask people, well, what do you think represents, you know, globalization to you? We found people generally picked all of these kind of more what you would think of as more positive images. If we talked about international trade agreements, then they would pick the more, you know, they didn't see the opportunity there so much in these focus groups. Um, and so that was really striking. And even in the informal conversations, you know, one of the things we kept hearing from people was, hey, this means I get to eat strawberries in winter. And that was, you know, that was like a key thing for people, no matter where they were. And so, um, so I think people understood that there were opportunities there, and they didn't see that term as 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 threatening somehow. Why? Um, well, I think there's been a long history, starting with NAFTA, of of um, a drumbeat saying that these things cause jobs to leave. Um, I think that the um, that has settled into people's consciousness. I think there is, while um, those who are participants uh, in international trade and who have you know been part of the conversation with the negotiators about what should be in trade agreements, understand, oh, we're opening this market, we're doing this thing. Um, I don't think that that information gets disseminated in the same way as the negative information does. And so I think we have a very uphill situation in terms of trying to explain to people the, the fullness of what is going on. The second piece I would say is there have been some bad effects from trade agreements. There have been some jobs that have moved. And I think that um, politically, folks haven't ever wanted to say anything bad. And I think the not acknowledging that has harmed the credibility of folks who talk about, oh, this is good, because people see that, well, wait a minute, there were some bad effects here. And I would also say I don't think there was an organized plan um, of how to deal with that. There was this trade adjustment assistance that was sort of very much um, focused on individual people, and that's not a bad thing, but I think if you know that a certain region or city is going to be very hard hit, say they are dependent on textiles, and you know that that's going to be a huge problem, I think you really do need to have a more whole of government approach to what those effects are going to be and trying to assist in that transformation so that folks can move to something else and aren't just feeling like they're left high and dry. Okay, there's so much to follow up on there. So I'm going to start with the perception part of this, the myth. Um, I want to ask you kind of a two part question here. One is about the actual myth. And this is one of the myths that you talk about in the report, which is that trade is the main cause of manufacturing job losses. That was a myth that you, that you heard and then tried to debunk, you know, among the participants. So it seems that that's a narrative that is just incredibly entrenched in the public mindset. That trade is the main cause of manufacturing job losses. And it seems like an idea that's very hard to dislodge despite data that is presented to the contrary, <laughs> that trade is in, in fact not the main cause of manufacturing job losses. Um, so I wanna first ask you, why is that narrative so entrenched? You talked a little bit about this going back to NAFTA and the way that that was talked about. Um, and the idea that the acknowledgement of some of the negative impacts of trade or the lack of acknowledgement rather. So you gave us a couple of reasons, but I wanna dig a little deeper and ask you, why is this so entrenched in the public mindset? And so if we're if we're stuck with that, is how do we kind of try to get out of that? Even though there are people talking a little bit more about it now more than there used to be. For example, Adam Posen, the president of the Peterson Institute of International Economics just did a very good podcast with the Council on Foreign Relations on this very topic and the data. <laughs> so how can we uh, create a, um, a conversation around this that reflects um, what the data actually shows us a little bit better? 
Well, I think I think those kinds of things like Adam Posen's podcast are really important. I think data is really important. I also think stories are really important and trying to um, showcase places that are actually doing well because of agreements. I think that um, <clears throat> people connect to that. Um, they've connected very much to the stories of, you know, factories that are closed or, um, you know, things like that. Um, and so much so that um, one of, to me, the most amazing stories happened to me in Iowa, um, where people were talking about a small town in Iowa that it had a a Maytag plant. And they said, oh, trade. This is what happens. Because of a trade agreement, all these jobs moved to Mexico. And this whole poor town is now just, you know, hasn't, has, is barely hanging on. And I found out that, in fact, what happened was that um, Whirlpool bought Maytag and moved the jobs to Benton Harbor, Michigan. Um, the jobs were not moved to Mexico. And yet that was, I heard that from so many people. It was, it was really, really interesting. So I think, um, I think we have to look at things realistically where that has happened. I think we have to acknowledge it. I think to the extent that there are cities and there's, there are that, and people that have not quite recovered those folks, we need to sort of have a plan for what is that gonna uh, entail? And it's not going to just entail trade. Trade isn't gonna fix everything. I think, but trade can be, and globalization and foreign direct investment can be a, a piece of economic prosperity. And there's a lot of cities who were flattened by competition, uh, like Pittsburgh, like um, Greenville, South Carolina, by competition outside the US, who were just thriving now, because they kind of ran into the storm and said, okay, we're going to have a plan and we're going to deal with this. And, and, you know, they were able to really, their cities are more vital than they were before. Let me, let me follow up on that aspect too, because you do have this focus on cities and kind of the success stories of some of the cities here that you visited. So tell us a little bit more about what made those cities successful in terms of finding their new footing, how to be competitive in this new environment. And are any of those lessons transferable or are they really very specific to that particular city's situation? Yeah, no, I think their lessons are totally transferable because each city that we looked at, um, we talked to folks, you know, who kind of had really been able to take advantage of the global world. That was one piece of their um, economic plan. So first of all, they sort of stepped back and said, all right, what do we have to work with here? What is our comparative advantage and how are we going to use that? And so, yes, each city's comparative advantage may be different, but I think the idea of having a plan, and then the plan was not just, okay, how's trade going to fix this? It was, in the case of Greenville, it was very much attracting foreign direct investment, but they, their um, comparative advantage is that they had people who knew how to manufacture, although maybe not uh, those who were textiles workers, they, they were able to attract the BMW who put its largest uh, manufacturing plant in the world there. Um, but what they did is they said, well, we have these community colleges and technical schools and we will train your workers so they totally fit into your, they know how to manufacture, but they may not know exactly you know, what is needed for you all. But they didn't stop there. And then they looked at how do we do high-end things? So how do we get Clemson University and University of South Carolina to start focusing on applied science? That's also going to feed into these companies that we attract and, and being useful to them. And then they looked at how do we make our city a livable city? And so they built bike paths and they, they repurposed old factories into um, loft apartments and mixed use development. And so they, they built a theater, they started emphasizing arts. So there was a whole of, um, of kind of how do people live approach. And Pittsburgh did something similar, 
Pittsburgh was a larger city, so they already had, you know, sports teams and things like that, but they had an economic plan, and they, part of their plan was, we need to get, we have these two universities, one's really good in medical, that would be Pitt, the other is really good in technology, that's Carnegie Mellon, how do we get these universities start working together, and, and that together they're going to be so much more formidable, and they are, so now they're doing all this bioscience and um, combining robotics with medicine, and <clears throat> so there's a lot of that going on there, and um, I think, and they said, how are we going to attract people to live in this city, you know, they were able to clean up the rivers, they were able to make the city a, a better place to live as well. So I think, I think each one sort of has a different, uh, a different facts underlying it, but having a plan and sort of having as part of it that you need to connect to the global world and how you do that is I think really important. Okay, thank you, Kathy. There's so much to talk about in this report. Um, so we're on this topic of myths and myth busting. Um, and I think it's very interesting that the methodology of this report was not only to sit back and listen to what people had to say about their perceptions about trade, but you and your team also took this opportunity to try to bust some myths, some commonly held myths about trade. And we talked about one of them already, and that was that trade is the main source of manufacturing job loss. But there were a few others that you heard. So I'd like to ask you a two-part question here. One, what are the other most striking myths that you, that you heard and then tried to bust? Um, and then also, how do you think um, working that into your methodology kind of shaped your findings and your takeaways here, where you were not only listening, but also kind of proactively taking on this role of trying to bust some myth, commonly held myths? Well, we, so the reason why we um, had some myth busting was because first we started off just talking to folks and these same myths kept coming up. So we were like, okay, well, why don't we try to put some pictures around this? Um, a picture being worth a thousand words. So one of the biggest myths that we heard is people thought between 50 and 80% of our trade was with China. And, you know, it's, it's a much, it's a sliver compared to the globe. Um, and so we, we actually just did some pie charts saying, okay, here's who our overall trade is with. And <clears throat> the EU as a collective is, you know, a huge part of our trade. People just were not aware of that at all. And so I think, how does that shape um, what we do? I don't know that it changed their opinion about overall about trade, um, but I think it made them think about, wow, um, this, I need to be aware of more when I hear news and think about, you know, what does this mean? Um, certainly nobody that we talked to felt threatened by trade with Europe. Um, you know, they were, they were like, oh, okay, you know, um, and, and so that part was very, very interesting. The other piece um, was that people felt like trade agreements were really just for large companies and that people were only paying attention to them. And so I think the other thing that people said they found very eye-opening was that 98% of exporters, uh, US exporters are small businesses um, as defined by the Small Business Administration. And they found that really, really interesting. Um, you know, the volume of course is not 98% because they're small businesses, but it's still large. And so I think that was very eye-opening for people. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily think, I mean, we didn't set out to convince people of things one way or another. Um, but we just wanted to see if we presented some facts, could those be absorbed? And we found that they, they could be. Um, because I would just say the other thing about this is that every single person we talked to said they felt like the media was biased and that they understood this was complicated, but they felt like they didn't know where they could go to get any just kind of straight factual information. Let me pick up on that point as well. So we did a similar type of study two years ago here in Nebraska, just in the state of Nebraska with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where we visited six communities across the state over a couple of weeks and talked to um, about 130 people in the state, uh, again, to get their perceptions 
on um, foreign economic issues. Trade was at the top of people's minds when we asked them. It was a little bit different setup than what you're doing, but at the same time, the aim was the same to get people's views and perceptions on this. And we heard very much the same thing from everyone that they wanted to learn more about international trade, but didn't always know or often did not know where to go to get information they felt that they could trust. Very similar findings. So I want to follow up with you on that and ask, you know, why do you think that is what can be done about that. I mean, there are, we talked about Adam Posen's podcast episode, which was very informative. There's, there are a lot of other things like that. So what is, what is the solution to um, that issue? Since you, you heard that from every, everyone, I think you talked to, we certainly did in our own study here. Um, the question is, how do you start to, to get at that, that problem? I think it's a really hard problem. It's, you know, the $64,000 question, um, not just about trade, but more broadly. And, um, I, you know, the only thing I know, because when we started this, we thought, oh, this is there, we're going to clearly know how to better communicate facts to people. I wouldn't say we came away with the answer to that. I did find that pictures, so like a chart or something where you can just kind of look at something and get the gist in a short amount of time and that it is based on you know statistics or something actually did help in this subject area and other ones it may not but in this one where people felt like they wanted to know more and didn't have information i think that um people found that useful um how that gets disseminated i think is another question and i guess you know we came away feeling like there needs to really be economics taught um, in high school or maybe even at a younger age so that people can um, parse for themselves whether something that's being said, you know, should, does this really make sense or doesn't it? And they may not know every detail, but at least they would have a more, some basis on which to look at things. Okay, that was one recommendation our student students here in the Yeder Institute came up with last year in a project to teach economics and integrate that into education at earlier stages um, where possible. But before we move into the recommendations in your report, I wanna unpack a few more of the findings here and particularly the perceptions or misperceptions. Um, I'm gonna integrate an audience question here next from one of my students in my trade policy class, who's asking um, about, he says, thank you very much you know, for being here today, Kathy, and also, why do you think the participants um, in your study viewed trade as mostly about manufactured goods? Um, that is such an interesting question, you know, and, and I, you know, my, my favorite story of that is talking to a um, entrepreneur in Michigan who had created Salesforce for small business. And he was telling me about this and, and how he was so proud they're in 23 different countries. And so then I said, well, what, you know, when I say international trade, like, what does that make you think of? And he's like, well, that has nothing to do with me because I'm a service and trade only applies to goods. And, you know, it's just kind of amazing. And I just think a lot of people don't even know what services are. Um, that was one of the other myths that we found. We asked people, you know, what percent of the U.S. economy is, a, is services? And they were like, oh, 10% or, you know, and, uh, you know, it's like 70 over 70%. And I think the perception of services is low wage jobs. And of course, you know, the things that are traded internationally are not usually low wage things. And so I think, I think there's a whole education piece that needs to be done about that as well. Okay, thank you. Along similar lines, you have a, a focus on small business owners in your report, and you, you mentioned that a few minutes ago about how 98% of small businesses do export, um, but you identified a kind of a disconnect there in your report that some um, business owners weren't aware, small business owners, I should say, of just how much they really were participating in the global economy. Now, they're working hard every day. They don't have the resources, human or financial, to follow some of the things that big corporations do in terms of global developments or what, what new trade agreements may have to offer. So um, you said they, they weren't always aware of how trade agreements had paved the way for what they were able to do in their businesses in terms of exporting. So talk a little bit more about the source of that disconnect 
um, and how that might be able to be kind of bridged or addressed? Yeah, I mean, I think that needs to be bridged in two ways, not just in the path of telling them, oh, you have these opportunities because we already have existing trade agreements. But I also think it needs to be bridged in the other direction, which is you're already engaged in international commerce. Like, where are the barriers you're finding? Because at least when we talk to folks, their barriers were much more practical. You know, they were around customs and getting things either into the U.S. or into another country and just kind of the mechanics of how to make things work. And, um, and so I think it's really important to understand what, um, what is hindering folks as well. Um, and to let them know, hey, you could do this, this or that. The one thing I found, though, is that in a lot of small businesses, they forged ahead, unaware that there were trade agreements that were letting them do these things. But they just saw an opportunity. And so they just went after it. And it was kind of irrelevant to them whether there were trade agreements or there weren't. Um, so that's why, you know, to me, there really needs to be much more integration. I think the Small Business Administration could play a role. We advised also, you know, setting up a trade core. I think getting some experience of volunteers could also um, be a helpful thing too. Okay, thank you. And I want to follow up on those recommendations here in a few minutes um, and, and dive into those too. Um, but before we do, you mentioned um, in the report that you discovered distinct regional attitudes about trade. Um, of course, trade has disparate impacts in different parts of the country, depending on what the base industries are. Um, right. So tell us a little bit more about those different uh, regional differences that you observed um, and what's driving them. Well, I mean, one thing that we found, and not, that's necessarily regional, but we found that cities that were port cities the general population in those port cities, even if they had nothing to do with the ports, was much more savvy about um, the mechanics of trade because it's sort of what gets discussed, you know, in their community. And, you know, we were in um, Charleston, South Carolina, right when um, the administration was putting the tariffs on China and people there who were very supportive generally of the administration were very, very um, upset about the tariffs um, because they understood, they were like, wait, you know, we can't have less, less goods coming in here um, because that's what we do. <laughs> and that's really gonna affect the livelihood of our whole city. So, I mean, I found that really interesting. Um, and so I would say, yes, there are regional differences. There's differences, you know, in farm states, I think you found much more support for trade um, because there's a lot of exports going on. Um, and um, so I think that was another piece of it. Um, in the, you know, the heart of places in the Midwest that had been really harmed by competition on the autos, um, there you found a lot more antipathy towards trade. Um, and some cities like Grand Rapids, Michigan had kind of been able to turn their boat and go in a different direction. And that had a effect on people's views on trade. Um, the ones that had not been, it was like just, there was no, nothing positive to say about trade from, from those places. And not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. We found that here in Nebraska too, again, there was a lot of support for the agricultural exports among everyone we talked to, whether or not they were actually involved in agriculture. So continuing along this perceptions line and the, and the perceptions that you heard, I'm gonna integrate another audience question again from one of my students. Um, and he's referencing something you said a little while ago about trade with the European Union. Um, and he asks, why do you think most Americans are okay, or at least the Americans you spoke with in your study, they're okay with trade with the European Union, but more hesitant on trade with China and Mexico? And are there regional differences in the United States in regards to which countries are viewed as threats? Um, we did not see regional differences in terms of who are threats. I think, I think the reason why people are more comfortable with the European Union is really about uh, wages 
I think it's about wages. I think it's about environment because what we found is people were really concerned about exporting jobs to low wage countries and they don't perceive the EU as a low wage place. Um, and there was a huge concern uh, pretty much across the board, regardless of political party, about trade being linked to environmental degradation, which was something else that surprised me. I just hadn't expected that. And um, so I think, again, there's not a perception of Europe as a major offender on an environment. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's really a lot of the uh, reason um, behind why people are not are, are not are perfectly fine with trade with Europe. And there's a lot of brands, you know, if you think about brands, you know, you think about what are the brands, there's a lot of designer things, there's a lot of, you know, um, food stuffs that people think are, you know, very cool, there's wine, there's, you know, all these things. So I think there's associations of a um, maybe a higher end um, of products also. Thank you. I also want to ask you a question too. Um, what we found in our study was that hardly anyone, if at all, talked about trade or the benefits of trade from a consumer standpoint. It was really all about exports, um, which is not surprising. I mean, exports get celebrated in press releases. They make headlines when they set records, right? Things like that. Whereas imports tend to be, I think, perceived in this negative light of looking at a trade deficit, maybe. Yeah. Um, so your report also noted that most people you interviewed didn't acknowledge how they personally, as a consumer, benefited from trade. Um, and I wonder, you know, why you think that is, or again, how is there something that should be done to discuss this differently? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting because when we would talk about it, you know, and people would say, well, I have nothing to do with trade. And, you know, the truth is that all of us, um, if we're unless we are the guy who lived that they just reported on who lived with no electricity basically in a hut in the middle of you know a forest if that's not us then we're probably touching international trade somehow um you know our clothes um our electronics you know th those things are things that um Part of those things are maybe being made here, but part of them are assembled elsewhere. So I, I think, you know, it's, um, I, I think people take it for granted. And once you start talking to them about it, they're like, oh yeah, that's exactly right. I hadn't really thought of that. And the other thing that we found, which was really interesting, again, right when the tariffs were being announced on things from China, people started to think about, wait a minute, um, my washing machine might start costing a whole lot more. My, you know, television might start costing a whole lot more. And they weren't like super happy about that. So, um, so I think um, part of it is that it's just not, no one talks about it. Um, and so um, I think that we need, again, to do a little more um, education. And the fact that 60% or more of our imports are inputs, meaning that we are actually making stuff, um, but we're, we're getting some of the parts of what we're making from somewhere else, which when we're able to do that at a less price, which makes us more competitive. But that's like a very derivative argument. It's not, you know, a soundbite. Yes, and I wonder, you know, following up on that um, trade and intermediate um, inputs, that's something I like to mention too, is just how much of what we import into the United States is actually a, a widget or a part or something that's needed to make the final product, um, or at least go into that value chain. So, um, you know, some economists have started working on trying to um, account for that trade and intermediate inputs better. And it, may, it would make our trade deficits look a little bit different because, you know, in our official statistics, as you well know, it's just that final good that kind of counts as an export from that country. So, so China gets a lot of credits for these final goods that it exports, even though it may have just done something at the very end to kind of finalize or finish that product. So um, I wonder, you know, where you think, you know, how important you think those efforts are. It's a much harder kind of statistical problem, and it relies on some private data that might be harder to get, but there are people working on it. So I wonder just, you know, where you think we can go from here in terms of telling that story more and kind of um, pulling the curtain back a little bit more for people on what it is we are importing and that a lot of that is 
is stuff um, that is needed to make more stuff <laughs> to make the final yeah. good. No, exactly right. And I, I, you know, again, these are not sound bites, and I think that's what makes them hard. But I do think trying to be more accurate about these things is actually would be a good thing, even if it's difficult. Because I just think about my own, where I worked at Apple, you know, most of the um, really expensive stuff, which is the intellectual property and designing the product and all of that work is all done in the US, but we don't get any credit for that. Um, and then the pieces, you know, the semiconductors, the the glass, actually a lot of that's made in the US. The, you know, all these different parts are not actually made in China. The phone, the iPhone, for example, is assembled in China. So all those pieces get put together, but it all the pieces don't come from there. And yet there's a zero um, credit, if you will, given to all of that, as you say. And I think. I think if we're able to present a better picture um, of that, or even of a car, um, I think how where do all these pieces of a car come from? Um, I, I think that people um, can absorb that, and I think the question then is how you know if you're concerned about it, and you should be having public support for how we engage with the world economically um, as a government. You would like to have um, the, the input that you're getting based on good information that people have, um, because I do believe people are the best judge of what's best for them. And so, you know, in order for them to um, judge, though, they have to have some, some input, you know, and not just go only on emotion, because trade isn't really an, um, uh, an issue that... Uh, uh, should lend itself to pure emotion. <laughs> okay, so one more, a couple more questions for you before we shift to asking about the recommendations in your report. And you know, one question I have for you is that, you know, some former trade negotiators like yourself that I've spoken with have reflected that, um, you know, the trade agreements are not designed in the first instance to create jobs. They can have that effect, but that's not their primary aim is to open markets, right, um, for U.S. exporters, um, and so they suggest perhaps that you know, have we if we put too much expectation on trade agreements and what they can do or solve in the domestic economy, they do have a spillover effect of creating jobs, but they're not designed to solve a lot of other problems domestically, um, even though they can get talked about that way um, or held up as being able to to kind of solve some problems. And so I wonder what your take is on that. And whether, again, we need to shift how we talk about what the agreements can actually do. Well, I guess I think in the end of the day, if you aren't trying to create jobs and value um, in the U.S., then you shouldn't be like engaging these things. So I never thought of trade agreements as disconnected from jobs um, when I was negotiating it. Um, I think it's hard to estimate how many jobs exactly are going to be created by something. Um, but I think that opening markets provides the potential for us to, uh, to sell more things. And that means that you need more people to make those more things, whatever those are, or to provide those more services. Um, and so I do see them as things that can help create jobs. Are they going to be a panacea for, for everything? No, they're not. And certainly the market that you're opening has to be large enough for that to make a difference. Um, but I, I also think on the flip side, um, to the extent that, that uh, certain industries here are going to face competition, from opening markets, because you need to have it be reciprocal. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that up front and not just try to bury it under a rug and then have, you know, a rug with this giant, you know, lump in it and say, oh, no, that rug is flat. Um, that That is, I think, really not good. It's not good for the people who are adversely affected. Um, and it's not good for being able to do things in the future. 
Um, and so that is, I think, needs to be a focus. I think that if we're going to think about opening markets and recognize that those need to be reciprocal, we also have to think about, all right, let's acknowledge that there's going to be something that may not go as well. There's going to be more competition. So what's our plan for that? Um, and we really haven't ever done that. So speaking of not ever having done that, let's shift into your recommendations and what you do and what you and your team do recommend be done based on what you heard um, from this listening tour. Um, one recommendation in your report that I found really intriguing was your call to create a trade core of volunteer experts uh, to engage with people at the local level. So tell us a little bit more about how this would work. What type of people would these volunteer experts be? Um, what would they do? And then what would they do with the information they gather from this engagement? Well, to me, this would be much more hands-on. And, and the, um, the analogy that I have is from um, when the Soviet Union broke up and Eastern Europe opened up and we were able to actually put together uh, teams, core, of experienced, for example, uh, retired CEOs who would go and help companies um, set themselves up and, and, you know, sort of operate in a market way, which they hadn't before. So when I think about a trade core, I think about that. I think about people who are um, very experienced, um, be they business people, be they policy people, who can then go work with small businesses, helping them access markets, who can work with cities, helping them like sort of have a plan and, and being able to implement it. So who could also um, do um, town halls and answer questions and, you know, just be a resource. Um, so that's how I think of it. Um, but I, I do think we need some rolling up our sleeves and not just having trade be the world of theoretical economists, of which I am not one. <laughs> so. We appreciate their contributions. We work with them here. But you, but I think that, uh, yeah, in terms of having a way to talk about this that people can connect to, there's something, you know, to add to what they're doing, too. And on that note, this segues very nicely into something else I wanted to ask you. And that has to do with another recommendation in the report um, that deals with the U.S. International Trade Commission, which hires a lot of economists to crunch a lot of data. Um, and so just for to remind our listeners, the International National Trade Commission um, is required in many cases by law to analyze free trade agreements after they've been negotiated as part of the process that that agreement goes through the approval process in the United States. So they do a lot of analyzing of proposed trade agreements and what the impacts economically, domestically would be um, of these agreements. And one of your recommendations in the report calls for the U.S. International Trade Commission to include mitigation recommendations for impacted communities in the analyses that they do of proposed free trade agreements, um, which I find very interesting because I think the ITC generally provides um, kind of objective analysis of the impacts of a trade agreement. And so I wonder, I have kind of a two-part question here for you again. Um, do you anticipate the agency would resist kind of getting into the business of making recommendations? Um, I'll start with that one and then follow up from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't expect the agency to uh, recommend things down to the nth degree. But I think, you know, they can, they identify already areas where uh, upfront, actually, before you even negotiate the agreements, uh, you as a negotiator actually get a confidential report that says, here are the areas that could be adversely affected. Here's the areas of greatest opportunity. And as a negotiator, you, uh, you know, you're in this little bit of silo. So all you can do is say, well, okay, if this area is going to be adversely affected, then I need to phase in the opening up of the market slower. So these folks have time to adjust. But I think, um, I think what um, they could do is sort of say, well, you know, we expect this to be a really hard hit or a, a less hard hit, or, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of very, very general in what they do. And I think that could provide a lot more information then for other agencies in the U.S. government to say, okay, uh, the Labor Department, the Small Business Administration, the Commerce Department, you know, to sort of say, okay, 
how do we pull together here and um, work with the local leaders where these industries are located to have some sort of a plan and be that a plan of retraining, you know, and, and making sure that there's opportunity in place for that, be that um, some sort of financial help for people to stay on their feet while they're retraining, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I think that the ITC could provide more granular information than they do now, both in the post-agreement analysis and in the pre-agreement analysis. Okay, so along those lines, then I wanted to ask you about um, a request that's been made of ITC. So our U.S. Trade Representative, Ambassador Catherine Tai, sent a letter in October just last month to the ITC asking them to study the distributional impacts of FTAs, um, specifically on um, the effects of goods and services trade and trade policy on U.S. workers by skill, wage, salary level, um, gender, race, ethnicity, age, income level, on all these measures, the distributional impacts. And I wonder if you see that as a step in the direction that you were thinking of in your Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's great because that, you know, again, I think, you know, everywhere we went, we heard this, you know, oh, trade has caused jobs to be lost. And we would ask people, well, do you personally know someone who's lost their job? We met almost no one who personally knew someone, but they were like determined that that was the case. And I think that sort of looking at this and trying to look at it in an objective way could really sort of be a basis for, all right, here are the folks who have been adversely affected. Like, how do we deal with that? Here are people who've actually um, been had a positive impact. And how do we start talking about both of these things in an honest and open way? Okay. I want to take a moment just to invite our um, audience to submit any questions that you have for Kathy through the Q&A function in the few minutes that we have left. Um, so while you're thinking about those questions that you might have, I'm going to ask another one about report recommendations. Um, and that is taking a step back, um, one overall takeaway from the recommendations in the report seems to me to be creating stronger links between local, the local level and the federal level. Um, and I wonder if you, if you think there's any risk of creating kind of too much information for federal level policymakers to take in since, since that is the level of government at which deals with trade policy. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any kind of risk there or what do you think about, um, or how would you answer the question, what should federal policymakers, which you were one, what do you do with all of this information, especially when you, some of it might be in conflict because of regional differences in how people perceive trade? Yeah, no, I mean, so part of your job as a government official is to balance things and you're always receiving conflicting information. You know, there, there's, there is, I can't think of an issue where everybody was just united around one thing. And so you're, you're put in a tight position a lot of times politically, depending on whatever, but also I think intellectually. And so to me, I think, you know, not having had this input has, has really left a gap in terms of what do you, what should you think about in terms of priorities? What should you think about in terms of outreach to folks, you know, when you're negotiating and you're in the middle of negotiating something um, and you know that a certain constituency really cares about it, you will often be consulting them informally during the negotiation. Hey, should I go right here or go left here? Should I, you know, what, what's going to help you the most? And widening the circle is a good thing. Yes, it makes it more complex, but we're here to serve the whole country, not just people who can afford to pay, you know, for somebody to follow this stuff in minute detail. Good point. Well, good point and well said, Kathy. Thank you. Um, how do you, you know, the report mentions um, that a new consensus, overall a broad consensus in the U.S. on the elements of U.S. trade investment policy must be built. So that's that's again a big overall takeaway that this report is driving at. So I'd like to ask you, what are what is at stake here? You know, what what is at stake if if we don't build that consensus? I think our leadership in the world is at stake. I think if a politicians 
you know, the conventional wisdom inside Washington is that working on international trade is a losing proposition politically, that, you know, this is just seen as a negative. And that makes people really hesitant to, um, to, to push forward. And I think uh, what that means is the rest of the world is not hesitant. <laughs> they are moving forward. And you even see what happened with the trade promote, you know, TPP agreement, right? Um, you see that it's now the CPTPP, that all of those member countries just moved ahead without us. And now China wants to join that agreement. So, you know, we, um, I think we risk being on the outside. And the truth is that we are going to trade and globalization is here. And so we can either um, try to sit back and pretend it doesn't exist, or we can say, how are we going to take the best advantage of it? And that's why we need a political consensus, because I, I believe it will be hugely detrimental to us to take the, we're, we're just going to wall ourselves off from everything and just, you know, exist on our own. That's not realistic. Thank you. I've got an audience question here for you as well. Um, and that is that the Department of Commerce, the International Trade Administration, the Small Business Administration, Export Import Bank, Development Finance Corporation, US Department of Agriculture, et cetera, all appear to be trying to make useful and helpful changes to improve programs and become more user-friendly, but it's still a giant maze. Should there be a flattening of the agency maze is the question. Well, I think, you know, I think there should be a one-stop shopping. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, these are complex things. So I don't think we want to um, uh, dumb down what the agencies are doing on the one hand. On the other hand, just if you're just a, a person, a small business, and you're trying to navigate all this, it's, you know, really, really hard. You don't even know what the opportunities are. And so I do think having some sort of a a Sherpa or something to help you, you know, kind of mm -hmm. navigate through would be a huge benefit. Okay. So do you think there, there are lessons from other countries on how to do this well? Some people talk about Canada as a country that has a very good system in place led by its government to engage in their case, um, you know, the provinces there. Um, you mentioned New Zealand earlier when I, you and I were chatting, um, and you've met with the New Zealand's ambassador to the U.S. New Zealand's government also has a process in place um, for engaging its public government-led. Uh, those are smaller countries, um, for sure, but, but do you think there are lessons from abroad that uh, could be drawn upon by the U.S. for the government to lead in engaging more? Yes, and I think Canada and New Zealand are two really good ones. Another one is Sweden, where they're very forward looking um, as to, all right, what as a government, if we look ahead, where are our challenges to our economy going to be? And, you know, and admitting that those were going to be challenges and and you know their um, for their their actually economy minister, when I was saying to him, why, why are Swedes so pro-trade? And he said, because we have been very upfront, you know, when our shipbuilding industry was gonna go away, when our textiles industry was gonna go away, we were very upfront, hey, this is gonna hit us like a ton of bricks. And we had, we marshaled the whole government to figure out how do we work with our industry so that people are not left high and dry. And, um, and so people feel like, um, they can turn adversity into benefit. And that's why they're not afraid. And I think that's, um, I think that's a lesson that we need to learn from all these countries um, so that people feel vested in what it is that we are deciding to do on their behalf. Thank you, Kathy. That Sweden's an interesting example too. I'm glad you brought that up. Last question that we have time for today, and this is again from one of my students, there's always a lot of interest in China in trade discussions, as I'm sure you've heard too. And one of the myths in your report is that most of our trade is with China from the US, which is, is a myth, as I said, and that's noted in the report, you mentioned it earlier. Um, so the question is simply kind of a, a broad one, but what recommendations would you have for US or Chinese leaders on the US-China trading relationship? I know that's a huge question right now. There is a lot going on. Um, so what would you yeah. say about trade within China generally right now? I would say, I think part of the difficulty that we have is that China's 
economic system is just very different from that of the West and it doesn't mesh that well. Um, and so we look at what we're doing and saying, okay, we have competition. Everybody is kind of competing on their own merits and China has state-owned enterprises, you know, which are subsidized and not really competing in a market context. And, you know, they're going to win every clash with us. Um, and some of what they're doing is destabilizing, you know, like the global um, steel uh, economy, for example. And I think we, we have to try to figure this out. I don't think that we are going to be able to tell China they just have to completely change their whole economic system. Even if we think ours is better, more efficient, more fair, I don't think that that is going to happen. So the question is, how do we get some rules of the road that are going to allow us to both exist um, there are, of course, some rules already in the WTO about, for example, protecting intellectual property, and those need to be respected. There aren't really rules about how to deal with the clash of such a large economy with everybody else. So one thing that I think we should do is commission the OECD to look at this question and um, sort of try to really think about how do we think about this. Um, the OECD has looked at a lot of complicated issues like uh, universal tax for digital things, um, privacy, you know, et cetera, long before folks enacted domestic things. And I do think we need some sort of combination of economists and um, politicians to really start trying to figure this out. Excellent, thank you. We are running up against our time here, Kathy. So I just wanna say thank you so much for sharing your time, your insights, allowing us to have this dialogue with you about what you found in the report, what you think should happen next. And we look forward to more conversations with you about what comes next um, with this report, very much so. Um, I wanna thank everyone who tuned in this morning, especially all of my students um, and, and everyone. If anyone wants to stay up to date on what we're doing in the Yider Institute, we invite you to sign up for our emails, listen to our Trade Matters podcast. And I'd like to note that a new biography of our Institute namesake, Clayton Yider, was just published. Um, and there's more information about that biography and the story of Clayton Yider's achievements in opening markets and paving the way for um, more open markets in our, in our present day and age. That story is told very well in a book called Rhymes with Fighter, Clayton Yider, American Statesman. So you can check that out on our website. Again, Kathy, thank you um, very much for all of your work on the support, you and your team, um, and for sharing all of these insights with us this morning. My pleasure and thank you. I'll look forward to more conversations. Very good. We'll certainly be, be talking with you more. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, All right. bye. Everyone, I wish you a great day. Thank you.